Hey everyone, the Xbox 360 back compat for Xbox One is undoubtedly one of the most impressive technological achievements of this console generation. Just the sort of basic idea of running games designed for an entirely different piece of hardware and to do so at the same speed, with the same visual fidelity, or better in both regards, is pretty incredible. And the reaction when Phil Spencer revealed Mass Effect running back in E3 2015 on Xbox One hardware was a combination of disbelief and, well, pure excitement. So how do we get from running on this to this? And better yet, what about the same game running at 4K on Xbox One X? How did that happen? So let's begin with the basic procedure first. Microsoft has created what it calls an Xbox 360 V GPU that works entirely on an x86 platform. Now, the original executable code for each game designed for IBM's PowerPC architecture, remember. This is reversed engineered into an intermediate, then compiled into x86. During this process, enlightenments are collected, instructions written to hardware, function entry points, etc. And shaders are collected too, the raw GPU code, if you like. Now, Xbox One doesn't just have a basic Radeon APU inside. There are customizations in the chipset to support Xbox 360's specific texture formats and also the older system's audio setup too. But the key takeaway here is that Microsoft has a full emulation layer for Xbox One that basically makes the system believe that it is an Xbox 360. Game code is not touched, not ever. The game never knows that it's not actually running on 360 hardware and checks are constantly made to the emulator to ensure consistencies in output with original hardware. And over time, as a result of this, the quality of the emulation has dramatically improved. But still, support for some elements of Xbox 360 graphics, audio support, even support for the security sectors on a 360 DVD, these are all baked into the Xbox One hardware, meaning that back compat isn't exactly a new idea that Microsoft came up with. It was a key objective many years ago. Now, when we first looked at the system in depth, there were issues. I mean, take a look at Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts here. An enforced double buffer V-Sync could see performance drop from 30 FPS to 20 FPS. And it wasn't just isolated to that title. It happened on a lot of them. Work needed to be done with the subpar Halo Reach really emphasizing the scale of the issue at its worst here. Now, Microsoft told me me that our analysis of Reach pushed them on to completely revamp their testing procedures, moving from a subjective side-by-side -side comparison with flap-style frame rate counters to a system based on objective metrics. Graphing performance over time exactly as we do in order to discover where the bottlenecks are. The difference is, well, we have a staff of four, they have over a hundred for testing. Of course, these days, Reach is in a much better state, as you can see here, and the same can be said for every back compact game we test these days. In fact, every single back compact release from back in the day has actually been revised twice now with improved versions of the emulator. Now, some games you won't notice any difference at all. They ran well back then and they still run well now. But generally speaking, those problem titles, well, they just perform much better now. Xbox One does a great job of more consistently hitting target frame rates. And screen tear, well, yeah, that is indeed a thing of the past, but we no longer have those double buffer V-Sync issues that we saw previously, certainly not to anything like the same extent anyway. And that kind of foundation is what made X-Enhanced 360 titles for Xbox One X a reality. Okay, so I've got an in-depth analysis of all seven currently supported titles elsewhere on the channel, and that is linked in the video description below. But here's the deal. The extra GPU power of the X is used to increase resolution by a factor of nine times. So horizontal and vertical pixel counts are each boosted by a factor of three. Do the maths here, and the last gen standard 720p scales up to full 4K. Well, how is this possible then? Well, one of Microsoft's developers, Eric Heichi, devised what is now known as the Heichi method. The game code is completely unchanged. The virtual Xbox 360 GPU scales up every render target and swaps out every surface at the emulator level using high-res versions of assets that are stashed in the X's RAM cache. The developers become what Microsoft describes more as craftsmen as opposed to a kind of back-compat factory here, tuning each game at the emulator level. 
So let's take a look at Halo 3 here. In its X enhanced mode, you're getting more pixels, sure, but you're also getting more detail, better LODs. Microsoft itself is tuning the title itself here just to show more. And it's the same here in Fallout 3. I mean, check this out. The extra detail here is simply immense and it's not just the pixel count. So how is this all done? Well, it's all to do with the way texture filtering works. MIP mapping is the process of creating increasingly smaller versions of the game assets. The MIP chain with detail lessening the further down the chain you go. Higher levels in the MIP chain are more opaque and Microsoft ups that level by around 1.5 times on X enhanced titles. So what was previously completely transparent can now be more visible, resulting in more detail. On top of that, individual aspects of the presentation can be fine-tuned for more detail as well. So again, in our analysis of Assassin's Creed on the X, we noted that dynamic shadows have more resolution further into the distance. In this case, Microsoft is isolating the shadow buffer and increasing resolution there by nine times. Now, this is not an option that's available for every game because this is a pretty extreme load being added to the game and it may cause performance issues, but it was possible to include it in Assassin's Creed. And dynamic shadows, not the baked pre-rendered ones, they also get a boost in Mirror's Edge 2, though the visual payback isn't quite so pronounced. Now, next up, let's go back to Halo 3 and we have the performance uptick. Now, we know that Xbox One and the X are obviously more powerful GPU-wise than the original 360. So this explains why performance drops are mostly eliminated. But on top of that, we also noted that bad frame pacing issues are also resolved. So yeah, you can see that kind of wobbly line there on the frame time graph gone on the X and the basic Xbox One. Now, surely this requires tweaking the game code, but apparently not. Now, seemingly frame pacing issues here are caused by the original 360 hardware hitting GPU limits. And those GPU limits are by and large removed on these two consoles, meaning smoother performance without changing a line of code. And another aspect worth talking about is the HDR support in X enhanced titles like Halo 3 and Mirror's Edge. And again, this is achieved at the emulator level without any kind of changes being made to the game itself. Now, in the case of these titles, they actually render internally on Xbox 360 in 10-bit color before being tone mapped down to 8-bit and sent to the HDMI port. So at the emulator level, Microsoft has what it calls a reverse tone mapper, essentially mapping a brighter than standard white signal, sending it straight out via the HDR10 color space. Now this can result in some pretty profound changes to the way the game looks, as we see here in Mirror's Edge when that HDR signal is translated back into SDR. Now Microsoft tells me that they liaise directly with the original developers to ensure that their vision for the title isn't being compromised by this process. So what about the original Xbox support for the One and the X? Well, every single game that's out there also benefits from the Haichi method. In fact, it was originally prototyped using OG software. So games here actually benefit in different ways depending on the hardware you're using. If you run an OG game like Criterion's Black here on a standard Xbox One, you get a two by two increase to resolution. So original 480p software should resolve to 960p instead. However, on Xbox One X, the boost is far more pronounced. You're getting 16 times the original resolution with the upgrade measured by a 4X boost to each axis. The process of bringing OG games to Xbox One is a little more straightforward than 360. Of course, the original hardware featured a customized Intel x86 CPU. Now, this isn't exactly binary compatible with the AMD Jaguars we have now. Those old games are 32-bit applications that need to be recompiled as 64-bit. And although Microsoft tell me it's not exactly an issue, those titles are also built on an old NVIDIA GeForce GPU. Now, what's curious here is that, of course, the Xbox 360 itself could run a range of OG games. So in actual fact, a lot of the technology that was used to make that possible, for example, handling multiplayer gaming, this was handled back in the day on the 360 using components from a system called Fusion. And those components have been ported over lock, stock and barrel and used on Xbox One as well. But this higher resolution OG Xbox support for the Xbox One poses a question. I mean, we're actually seeing a variation of the Haichi method here for standard Xbox One hardware. We're getting a decent boost to resolution. 
So why only OG games? Why not Xbox 360 titles as well? After all, if an Xbox One X can handle 4K upgrades of 360 games, the maths kind of suggest that the standard one can handle 1080p. So I did ask about this and it turns out that Microsoft does have a proof of concept but the issue is that it doesn't work on every game and sort of scaling up by 1.5 times in each direction rather than a round number presents integer issues. But whether that will be resolved, whether it will roll out for compatible games only, whether there's even a will to do it at Microsoft sort of remains to be seen. But that's where I'm going to leave things for now. We'll have a full interview with the Back and Pat team going up on Digital Foundry at Eurogamer soon. And once that's up, I'll leave a link to it in the video description below. But in the meantime, please do like and subscribe to support the sort of work we do here at Digital Foundry. We want to push further, we want to do more, and you can help that happen by supporting our Patreon, which also gives you access to pristine downloads of everything that we do. But yeah, that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.